tonight and uh, if you can uh, join our worship with us, we're going to start off with a couple songs. Uh, first, the number 12, God of Our Fathers. We have two songs in our prayer and scripture reading. God of our fathers, whose almighty hand leads forth in beauty all the starry band of shining worlds in splendor to the skies, our grateful songs before thy throne of grace. Thy love divine has led us in the past. In this great land by thee our lot is cast. Be thou us ruler, guardian, guide, and save. Thy word her all, thy path our chosen way. From war's alarms, from deadly pestilence, be thy strong arm, our ever sure defense. Thy truth religion in our hearts increase. Thy bounteous goodness nourish us in peace. Refresh thy people on their toilsome way. Lead us from night to ever-ending day. Fill all our lives with love and grace divine. And glory, Lord, and praise be ever time. Song will be number ninety seven. All day long of Jesus I am singing. He's my song of joy will ever be. All the while he keeps my heart bells ringing. For his love is everything to me. He's my king, and till I dearly love him. He's my king, no other is above him. All day long, in raptured praise I sing. He's my savior, he's my king. Streams of love around my soul are flowing. From his heart, love's everlasting spring. That is why my faith in him I'm showing. That is why an endless song I sing. He's my king, and so I dearly love him. He's my king. No other is above him. All day long in raptured praise I sing. He's my Savior, he's my King. In his light I'm going home to glory with the souls who trust his saving grace. Going home to sing and tell a story in the blessed sunshine of his face. He's my king, and so I dearly love him. He's my king, no other is above him. All day long, in raptured praise I sing. He's my savior, he's my king.
bow with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now so humbly in prayer, thankful for another day of life that you've blessed us with, and another opportunity to gather here as your children, to sing songs of praise and hear a portion of your word. Lord, as we continue on through this service tonight, we ask that you help us keep our minds focused where it should be and to be paying attention to the songs that we sing and the words that we hear. Lord, we ask as we, we focus on the message being spread throughout the world that we think about the opportunities not just on a global scale but locally and consider the opportunities that we have each and every day. Let us be encouraged by the things we hear tonight and be granted the courage that we may speak up in our own little way so that we can spread your gospel one person at a time. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us each and every day, and we ask that you never let us take one breath for granted. And it's in Jesus' name we pray now. Amen. Tom and Nina Butterfield asked me to uh, send you their greetings, said they uh, love the church here, and told me to tell everyone hello. So I told them I would do that for them. Scripture reading tonight, Matthew 28, verses 1 through 7. Matthew 28, verses 1 through 7. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. Scene number 222. Of one the Lord has made the race, the one has come, the fall. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. Say not the heathen far at home, beyond we have no call. For why should we be blessed alone? The gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all. The gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go his grace. The gospel is for all. Receive ye freely, freely gifts from every land they call. Unless they hear they cannot live. The gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go, his grace, the gospel is for all. Well, good evening, everyone. If you weren't already aware of it, we have a guest speaker this evening. Uh, Andy Baker will be, will be with us, and he'll be giving us an update on the, uh, the outreach from the World Christian Broadcasting Ministry. And in addition to that, he'll be incorporating a lesson from the scripture reading we had tonight. So let's welcome Andy. Well, good evening, church. We'll try that again. Good evening, church. I appreciate the way everybody's scattered out all over the entire auditorium tonight, giving plenty of room for latecomers to come in. I'm just glad you're sitting wherever you're sitting. Thank you for being here, and thank you for inviting me to come and share this special time with you. One of the neatest parts about my work at World Christian, that as I get to travel, I get to meet family members I didn't know I had. And although we do not know one another, because of our commitment to Jesus, we know a lot about one another, don't we? 
So it's a it's an honor to be in your family tonight and to get to meet brothers and sisters I didn't know that I had. So thank you for your warm invitation and opportunity to, to be with you tonight. Let's have a Bible check. Hold them up. No songbooks, please. No songbooks. You can hold you can hold up those un, in, uh, unscri- un, unscriptural and unproductive uh, iPhones and iPads if that's what you want to use. I want you to have your eyes on this passage of scripture. So whatever you want to use to get there, that's fine. And I hope that you'll take a few notes as well because of what's going to come out of this particular passage. We are in Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse number 1. I'm not going to reread the passage, but I want you to think about several things with me. I think this is a great, great paragraph or two of study. It's resurrection morning, and this is a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the impact that it had immediately on his followers. In Matthew chapter 28, the angels are going to appear to the ladies. And they have the first opportunity to announce to the world that he is risen. Is anybody in this room happy and thankful for what Jesus did on the cross for us on Friday? Is anybody thankful and appreciative of that? Without that, we're in a mess. Without the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, we've got a sin problem we cannot solve ourselves. Is there anybody in the room thankful and appreciative of what happened on Sunday morning? I hope that we are. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the clincher that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is the Son of God. Here's what I want us to do tonight for about 15 minutes. I want us to, to digest this passage. And I want you to see a picture of four words that's in this passage. I'm going to encourage you to circle them if you're so inclined in your Bibles or to underline them, or at least maybe take note about these key words. Because not only is it a picture of what God, I think, wants the church to be doing today, it's also a picture of the mission that you and I have as sons and daughters of God. Matthew 28, beginning verse number 1. It is resurrection morning. The earthquake occurs. By the way, if there are replays in heaven, I want to see this one. If there are replays in heaven, I want to see this one. I want to feel the earthquake. I want to watch them as they rolled that stone to the side or rolled it back or got it, got it out of the way. And by the way, did, did, they have to, did God have to take away the stone so Jesus could get out? How would you answer? No. The stone was taken away so you and I could look in and see the evidence that is there. The stones rolled to the side. The angels are there. The angel's words are very, very powerful. The ladies are there, and they hear some good news that they can't really comprehend, that Jesus Christ was raised up from the dead. In Matthew chapter 28, begin reading with me, if you will. We'll re- be- begin reading in verse number 4. For fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Let's stop right there. These ladies are excited and joyful and fearful at the same time. Have you ever had those emotions going on within you at the same time? Joyful, fearful at the same time. That's where they were. And they hear these angels say, don't be afraid. 365 times in Scripture, the Bible reminds us not to be afraid. How many days are there in a typical year? Oh, about 365. Could it be that the Lord knew that you and I would need reminders not to be afraid? Is anybody in this room, would it, would it be good to, for anybody in the room, if you had people, they would every now and then look you in the eye and say, don't be afraid? Well, throughout Scripture, that's one of the phrases you read often, and the angel does it right here. It's one thing to tell me not to be afraid. It's something else to give me reason not to be afraid. And they're about to have the reasons why not to be afraid. I want you to underline that phrase, though, because we need to be a church that reminds each other often, don't be afraid. The angel now have the attention of the ladies because the angels have said, he's not here, he is risen. The next couple of passages are where the four key words are that I think is the message of, resur- of, uh, of resurrection. I think it's, it's a picture of what God wants you and me to do and what he wants us to realize we have in Christ. Notice the words again in beginning in verse number 6. He's not here for he is risen, as he said. Come 
see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples he is risen from the dead. Did you see the four key words? Did they, did they jump out at you? The four key words I want you to at least note in your notes, circled in your Bible if you are so inclined or underlined, is the key words come, see, go, and tell. Those four key words I want you to take personally because that's the message that in the past or maybe right now you and I need to believe and need to follow as we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't know where you are in your journey with God. So let's start with you and me in these four key words. The first key word was the word come. I want everybody in the room to realize that we serve an invitational God. We serve a God who's always inviting people to come to him. It all started back in the Garden of Eden. God invited Adam and Eve to follow him. They had some other plans, didn't they? They had some other priorities. They had another way to live besides the way God wanted them to live. God is an invitational God. He invited Abraham to follow. He invited Moses to lead. He invited a lot of folks in the Old Testament time to follow him. Please come and follow me was the message of God. What was the message of the prophets? Come back to God. In fact, you read it on almost in every page of the Old Testament time. When you get to the New Testament time, you, you look at the ministry of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see him inviting people to follow him. You see people from all walks of life being asked to come and follow him. Church, are you listening? It's applied to you. God is inviting you and me always to come to him or to come back to him. You and I have neighbors and friends that think because of what's going on in our world, God doesn't like them very much. And you and I need to communicate with our lives and with our message. We serve a God who invites us to come to him. Can you quote the passage with me? Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and... Learn of me, meek and lowly in heart, you'll find rest for your souls. That's a great, great passage about coming to the Lord. I want you to realize you don't have to wait till Sunday to come to the Lord or to come back to the Lord. You don't need an aisle to come down to come or to come back to the Lord. In fact, you didn't have to come through the double doors tonight to come into the presence of God. The truth is you and I live in the very presence of God. Is that scary or is that exciting news to know? Give me some feedback here. Is it scary? Is it exciting? And you're probably doing this with both, with both questions. You live in the very presence of God. You didn't all of a sudden come into the presence of God when you came into this building. If we didn't learn anything during the COVID months, we learned a lot about our individual relationship with God. We learned a whole lot about our individual relationship with God. God wants us to come to him, and he wants us to come back to him, and we can do it any time. You don't go to church. You are church. I'd rather go to church because then I could leave church. But if you are church, you never get out of church. I used that phrase Friday night in the lesson that I did on the campus at, at OVU. There were two little girls sitting about five rows back intently listening and when I said you never get out of church, one of those little girls went, <sighs> but if you live in the very presence of God, you are church. You don't go to church. I'd rather go to church because then I'd, I could leave church. Brothers, have you ever been in this lobby and you wanted to tell a joke to a brother and you thought where you are and you thought, oh, I can't tell that joke. I'm in church. If you told that joke anywhere, guess where you told it? I didn't hear you. You told it in church. Ladies, have you ever picked out a wardrobe on Sunday morning and you looked at that dress or the outfit and you thought, oh, I can't wear that because I'm going to church. Well, ladies, if you wore it anywhere, guess where you wore it? I didn't hear you. In church. Let me find out the, let me see the guilty folks in this room. How many as parents on Sunday morning would tell your children, go upstairs and get on your church clothes? Anybody guilty? My hand's the only one up. Am I the only one that's guilty? And then when you get home from church, what did we tell our kiddos? Go up and take off your church clothes and put on your play clothes. The truth is we are church. You live in the very presence of God. 
And I, I don't know where you are in your journey with God, but God invites you to come to Him. Do y'all sing that song, Just As I Am Here? Do y'all sing that song? Sometimes we, we don't look forward to singing that song because we'll sing all the verses. But if you look at the words of that song, it is a great song. God takes you and me just like we are, just as I am, but He loves me so much He won't let me stay that way. He changes our lives more into the image of Jesus Christ. That's exciting news to know. Come is the first key word. I want you to take it personally, but also I want you to use it with your neighbors and friends about coming to the Lord. He is, he's in their corner. Second key word, see. God invites you and me to come to him, not with our eyes closed, because the evidence is there. There is evidence for us to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let's look on this page where we are. I bet you have preached, and I have too, we might need to repent that the tomb was empty. The truth is, the tomb wasn't empty. You got the angels there. You got the stone that was rolled to the side. You've got the clothes in which the body of Jesus had been wrapped. If you look at the Greek text, it, 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 it's kind of like the, the clothing just settled on that piece of rock. You had the napkin folded to the side. You had the angels that was there. The truth is, the tomb was full of evidence. There's a church in Garland, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas, that has a Baptist about as large as yours. It's down on the pulpit level, and they have a giant round rock that's in front of the baptistry hole. And when they have a baptism, they roll that thing to the side. Last time I was there, they had a baptism. It kind of moved me a little bit to see that stone roll to the side, the picture right here on this particular page. Come, see the evidence that is there. Let's put it like this. Let's see if we are on the same page. I believe we can know for sure that God exists. Do you? I don't think we have to wish it or hope it. I think we can know it to be true. And if somebody doubts God's existence, they just need to ride around in West Virginia and Ohio for a while. I've been in your state since uh, Wednesday. I've been riding around. you got a beautiful place to live. Do you know that? Appreciate your enthusiasm. You've got a beautiful place to live. Did you know that? And if you can't see the creation and the handiwork of God by riding around Ohio and West Virginia, you got some problems. I think we can know for sure God exists. I think we can know for sure that Jesus is the Son of God. I don't think we have to wish it or hope it. The evidence is there. Just on this page is sufficient evidence for us to believe. I think we can know for sure that the Bible is the Word of God. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. Do you? I hope that you do. I think we can trust those things to be true. My point is this. Come and see the evidence that is there that you and I might become believers. But that's also our message to our neighbors and friends, to come and see the evidence that is there. Once we've seen the evidence, once we've accepted our Lord as our Savior, then we've got a message to go with. That's the third key word. Did you notice, notice the third key word in verse 7? And go quickly. The religion of the Bible, the religion of the New Testament is a go religion. It's not staying, staying in a place where it's just where you are comfortable. It's going where the gospel is not. The reason I'm going to show you some slides in about five minutes is because you've got your fingerprints all over the antennas in world Christian broadcasting. You're broadcasting the gospel to the entire world every day. Would it tickle anybody in the room to know that Throughout this day as we've worshipped and had time this afternoon with our families maybe and back again tonight, would it thrill anybody in the room to know that today the entire world was covered with the gospel with 30 hours of programming? Andy, how did you get 30 hours in a 24-hour period of time? From Alaska, we turned on the signal at 4 o'clock in the morning your time. And with two antennas, it broadcast the gospel for 16 hours. We just went off the air just a little bit ago. And in the country of Madagascar, okay, let me get reminded, what, what time is it? Five something? They're nine hours ahead of us. So they're getting ready for today's programming coming out of Madagascar. Today, some little girl in the world heard the sweet name of Jesus for the first time. Does that please you at all? That's your ministry that I'm about to share with you in just a second. Come, see, go. And then that fourth key word was the word tell. You and I have got a message worth telling. 
Amy Rockford is a friend of mine back in Tennessee. She has cancer. She's now going through treatments. If I knew the cure for cancer and I didn't tell Amy, what would you think about me? You wouldn't think very highly of me, would you? You and I know a message that can save people's souls. And shame on us if we don't share that message with, with as many folks as we can. Several years ago when I was in college, my grandmother, my grandmother Baker, had to have cancer surgery. My dad had to work that day. He, didn't, he wasn't able to get off, and he was about an hour, hour and a half away. I went because I was home from college that summer, and I went and sat with the family at St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee. After about an hour and a half or two hours, the doctor came out. Uh, we don't have cancer. Your grandmother's going to be okay. She doesn't have any cancer at all. About six or eight days later, I found my dad and told him. Do you believe that? I left the hospital speeding, went to the, where my dad was working about an hour and a half away, spun some gravel, busted in the door. Dad, Dad, Granny's okay. We don't have cancer. Why did I do that? Because I had good news to share. Church, we've got some good news the world needs to hear. In fact, after the last 14 months, we got a lot of people in our world searching. We got a lot of folks searching for hope. We got a lot of folks in the world that thinks God doesn't like them because of all the stuff that's been going on in our world. I want you to see these four key words as it relates to you. God invites you to come to him. He invites you to see the evidence that is there. But once we find out about that information and the truth about Jesus, he wants us to go and tell that message to a lost and dying world. Would you circle those in your Bible, at least in your notes, and remember those four key words. Come, see, go, and tell. We'll find out how old you are. Anybody in the room ever heard the name Gabriel Heater? Anybody? Well, this is a young church. He was a war correspondent in World War II. He had a radio program every night. No matter what was going on in the war, he would spin it to make it sound good. In fact, he came on every night with these, these words. There's good news in the world tonight. You and I know news that's better news than Gabriel Heater ever had. And that is that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for our sins. And we have an opportunity to be forgiven of our sins. In fact, do you realize that the worst day in the life of Jesus was the best day of our life? I need some head nodding. Does that make sense? His death on the cross, his worst day of his life was the best day for you and for me. Because that meant that we had an opportunity to find out about salvation in Jesus Christ. You and I share a ministry to the world that I want to share with you for the next, oh, two hours and a half or so. I want to share with you in about 10 minutes what your ministry is doing through the tools of World Christian Broadcasting. Would it encourage you to know that just a few years ago that the entire world was covered with the good news about Jesus Christ? Will you say, Andy? The whole world was already covered with the good news about Jesus because of the Internet, right? And the answer is no. If you look on the screen, you'll see a map of the world. You see the lighted areas on the map, and that's where the Internet is. The dark places on the map is where the Internet is not. The dark places on the map is where we aim our signal, most of it throughout the day. Andy, why wouldn't the entire world have access to the Internet? It can be so useful. There are some countries that won't allow the internet into their countries. One place is North Korea. That's one reason why we want to begin Korean programming next, because the only thing that that kook can't keep out of his country is a shortwave radio signal. He can destroy Bibles, he can destroy religious material, but the signal doesn't stop at his border. He can't keep it out. And there are three billion shortwave radios in the world. Andy, why wouldn't some of these other countries want the Internet? Some can't afford it. There are some countries that are so poor they cannot afford the infrastructure to, to make it available to their people. 
And then there's some places like China that wants to block the signal from the Internet coming in from the West. This map is really important to us because it kind of gives a picture of where we want to go with the gospel and why. I wonder do you to know how this whole thing got started in World Christian Broadcasting. At the end of World War II, there was a second lieutenant that Roosevelt commissioned to do something pretty special. Roosevelt was going to go to the Yalta Conference with Churchill and Stalin. Back at that time, you could communicate straight line, but you couldn't communicate with someone on the other side of the globe. The president commissioned a second lieutenant to come up with a tool to he, whereby they could communicate back to the White House while he was at the Yalta Conference. The second lieutenant came up with the tool of shortwave radio. How many in the room have a shortwave radio? One. Doesn't surprise me. How many have AM and FM? When every hand goes up, we know what that means. He used the tool of shortwave radio to take his voice, the president's voice, around the world. At the end of the war, brother Maurice Hall, that second lieutenant, said, wait a minute, that means we can preach the gospel to the whole world using the same tool. Thirty-seven years later, we began broadcasting to the world from antennas that I'm about to show you. He was that second lieutenant. He died at age 99, in fact, three days after his birthday. But his mind was sharp enough before he died to realize his dream had come to about taking the good news of Jesus Christ to the whole world. I want to bring you greetings from Franklin, Tennessee, the international home of World Christian Broadcasting. It's the place, this building is nothing special about the building. It's a little one-level rectangle building. But it's holy ground because of what takes place in this building. We do all of our taping for all of our programs in this building. Let me back up. I used to show this slide with snow on the ground. Because I wanted our guys up in Alaska to know we can grow snow too down here in the south. But I put this slide in instead. Here that seven languages are recorded every day for programming. We do, we do 49 hours of fresh programming every week. I'll let you react to that. In seven different languages that blankets the globe every day. I've got a copy of this map out on the table to, through the doors to the left. That's the table that I use for, uh, for tonight. This map helps you realize why we went to Alaska and why we went to Madagascar. Remember a moment ago I said the uniqueness of our work is to take the gospel where missionaries can't go. Somebody help me in the room. Where could our missionaries not go 40 years ago? Russia and China and some down the Pacific ground. That became our focus and that's why we went to cold, frigid, anchor point Alaska to build an $8 million radio station to, to take the gospel into Russia and into China and down the Pacific Rim. Ladies, there's a, the flower, the Alaska flower is what they call a fire weed. It blooms from the bottom up. When the sun shines on the bloom, it looks like fire. Um, about August, the blooms get all the way to the top. When it does, it's going to snow in three weeks. So you can bank on it. Why in the world would you go to frigid where it snows feet? We went there because from there we get a good strong signal into Russia and into China from antennas that I'm about to show you. I'll show you this map again. Why would you go to a third world country for that other radio station? I'll show you why in a second. I'll bring you greetings from station KNLS. You've got fingerprints all over what I'm about to show you. You've been a part of our work over the last few years. And you've helped this an these antennas take the gospel to the world. There's your two antennas in Alaska. You've got three towers holding up two curtain antennas. Each tower is 365 feet tall. They're 385 feet apart. And we've got two antennas there stretched between the three towers. You see the towers on the right are painted. You see the one on the left is lighted. You either got to paint it or light it. We've been, uh, we painted the first two towers. When we put up the new tower a few years ago, we decided to light it. Three weeks ago, one of our neighbors complained that our light at, on the antenna was keeping him awake at night. We told him we could solve that with the $10,000 contribution. That's how much it takes to paint a tower. His conclusion was, I think I'll just go to Walmart and buy thicker blinds. So that's how, that how, we, that's how we solved that problem. 
What you're looking at with the two antennas is six acres of wire hanging up in the air. I'll let you react to that. Six acres of wire hanging up in the air. And from those two antennas, the entire world has, has we've made contact with the entire world every day with the good news about Jesus. When both antennas are on and they are on at the same time, they are sending out 32 million watts of power. When they're on, you can stand in front of those antennas and hold a fluorescent bulb in your hand, and that bulb will glow. We're not sure what it does to your heart, but it'll make a light bulb glow. And for 16 hours every day, we broadcast in Russian, in Chinese, in English. And from those two antennas, we've literally heard from every country of the world. The entire world has heard the message about Jesus in those three languages almost 38 years. In July the 23rd, well, you may want to put that on your calendar and pray a prayer of thanksgiving. That's when we'll celebrate 38 years of broadcasting. That's Alaska. And from Alaska, Andy, what's your biggest issue? Biggest issue is moose, an occasional black bear, and wind. Well, Andy, it's a curtain antenna. Well, wind is our big culprit, not ice or not snow. Wind catches in that antenna, and it'll put so much pressure on it. Sometimes those cables up at the top that's very thick, it'll, it'll snap those, and the curtain will sag. So what do you do then? You bring it all the way down, repair the cable, crank it back up like a flag. We've been doing that since 1983. At the base of each one of these towers is four concrete wheels stacked on top of each other, about the size of large tractor wheels. There's cables attached to that that go to the tower and the antenna so they won't blow away. Kevin, our main guy there, has seen that 16 inches off the ground. I'll let you react to the wind. We have wind issues in Alaska. But for 38 years, we broadcast the gospel literally to the entire world from there. You got fingerprints on there. The map again. We made a decision a few years ago that the Middle East needed to hear about Jesus. Does anybody in the room think that was a good decision? I hope you do, because that part of the world needed to hear about Jesus. We needed to do that. We needed to be somewhere in the Indian Ocean. We visited the Seychelles Islands. We visited Mauritius. And then the president of Madagascar, have you seen the movie? If you've got grandchildren, you've seen the movie. It looks a little different. The president of Madagascar gave us 84 acres of land. Well, how did that happen? It's an Esther story. He was in this position for just such a time as this. Because right after he gave us the land, a few years later, a coup happened. So he was in that position just for such a time to give us that land whereby we could build an $11 million station to take the gospel to the rest of the world. If you look at this map real quick, one antenna faces east. Australia gets it from both both antenna or both sides. The main goal with that one aim to the east is we wanted to make sure that we could blanket India. Well, how many folks live in India? Oh, just a billion. In fact, it's going to be the largest populated country in the world very soon. It'll overtake China. The first antenna blankets that part of the world. The second, the second antenna is aimed directly north. You see the two red lines on the map? That's the 10 degree 40 degree latitude on the map. 10 degrees north latitude, 30 degrees south latitude. Between those two red lines, 97% of the world's unchurched live between the two red lines. 97% of the world's unchurched live between the two red lines. That's why we went to Madagascar, to take the gospel into that part of the world. Last year, we had 500,000 connections with Arabic-speaking people. Would you react to that opportunity? It's making contact with that part of the world that needs to find out about Jesus. Third antenna is aimed to the west, and we blanket Africa. Well, Andy, what language do you, what, what language do you speak in programming to Africa? English. Well, why do you do that? In Africa, there are 10 main languages. No more than 10% of the people speak any one of those languages. If we spoke in Swahili, which is the most popular, that way 90% of the audience would understand our message. But since English is so popular in Africa, 
We use people from Africa to do the voicing of the program. You do not want a guy from Middle Tennessee doing programming into Africa. So we'll use missionaries that we can work with to broadcast the gospel all over Africa. In sub-Sahara Africa, there are more people that have smartphones than have indoor running water. But it doesn't do them any good because they cannot afford to buy wind, uh, 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 enough from a, a company to be able to use their smartphones. They've got them, and there's a lot of them there, but they can't afford the payment price to be able to use them. Shortwave is still the way to reach into that part of the world. Then we found out something the Lord gave us we didn't realize. If you can ch look on the map, remember I, sh I told you that the shortwave signals bounce. We can bounce the signal on the water in between Madagascar and Africa and bounce the signal over Africa. And what's the next country over? South America. That's why we began Spanish, and that's why we began Portuguese. So today, seven languages blanket the go. That's why we went to Madagascar. It would get a good, strong signal into that part of the world. Madagascar, about the size of California and Oregon combined. If you look right in the center of the, of the map, it's, you'll see the capital city, Anatana Revo, Tana for short. It's a country of about 23 million people. About 7% are Muslim. We know of a Church of Christ in the capital city of 100 with elders. But besides that, the church is really, really, really weak in Madagascar. Why do we go there? Because from, if you'll continue looking straight up, there's another city that's in bold, bold print, Majunga. In Majunga, we have built an $11 million station. Oh, by the way, that $8 million station in Alaska is all paid for. And oh, by the way, this $11 million station in Madagascar is all paid for. I'll let you react to that. What makes that true? The God of heaven. I wish I had the time to tell you some God stories that's brought all this to pass. You can go on Google Earth and see our antennas. If you want the dimensions and the numbers, I'll give you those before I leave tonight. You can go on Google Earth and see these antennas that I'm about to show you. Real, real quick, there's our campus. Let me take you on a quick, quick tour. From 400 feet up, we took what I'm hopefully, yeah. This is your radio station I'm about to show you. You got fingerprints all over it. There's, we had to build several buildings there. We couldn't use the Homer Electric would not run a wire down to Madagascar. I don't know why they wouldn't want to do that. So we're having to do our own electricity in Madagascar. You'll see uh, in the background there two 64,000 liter tanks for our diesel fuel. You see the different buildings there that we had to build to, do, to, to, to be able to broadcast the gospel from that particular site. That's looking straight down. You need to know really why I've come. We need a volunteer to change some light bulbs out on the antenna. And most churches offer their preacher. I don't know what that means. There's a sunset in Madagascar. You see the four towers with the three curtains. We got six acres of wire hanging up in the air in Alaska. We got nine acres of wire hanging up in the air in Madagascar. And from these antennas, the entire world is covered with the good news of Jesus every day. Some of you are turning around backwards because that screen's a little clearer. You might want to do that. In a Ford truck, is that okay if we send a Ford truck over there? I hope it is because that's what we did. Everything we, that you're seeing came over on a boat from America. They don't have Lowe's down there or Walmart. So everything that you see, every nail, every screw, every piece of equipment was brought over from America. There's our campus, and you, you can, by look, looking at that picture, can you tell what our biggest issue is there? Fire. It's so dry and arid, fires pop up just really, really quickly. Three of our guys, that's their job to take care of that issue every day. And we've had three or four fires that have, uh, have threatened our campus there. On the, on the campus there is a generator building, a transmitter building. That's our truck going up to the antennas. Is this a little bit bigger than you thought it was? This is a big deal. We're not a little fly-by-night organization running by the seat of our britches. We're highly respected all over the world in the shortwave industry world. There's our campus. 
Ladies, the first building to the right, we built a small staff home for our families to live in that's going over there to work. Which would be the most important room to you besides bathroom if we were going to build you a house in a third world country? Which room would be the most important? Let me read you lives. Kitchen, exactly right. We built Nancy a nice kitchen, but we caused an issue in their marriage. She wants that same kitchen built in, in, in their home in Alaska. We, we caught, we'll, let, we'll let them deal with that. I want you to kind of get an idea about your station in Alaska and Madagascar. This is really what it's all about. We're not about wires. We're not about antennas. It's about people. And I don't know what country stirs your heart. I don't know what country stirs your heart. But these are the countries we hear from regularly. And we've heard from every one of them in time. These are your antennas. This is your ministry. I've come to thank you. I came also to give you a chill bump or two. I hope you got one or two chill bumps because the Lord is blessing this tool to get the good news of Jesus to the entire world. We've got a website for each one of our languages, and they are doing great, great, great things. In March, our Russian website had 17,000 unique visitors just that one month. We are doing shortwave and doing it well, but we're also using other media to get the good news of Jesus Christ out. I'll close with this slide. Right there is our challenge, and there is our opportunity. You see Madagascar off the coast of Africa. There's antenna one. There's antenna two. And there's antenna three. Antenna one. Antenna two. Antenna three. With those three antennas and the two in Alaska, the entire world is covered every day with the good news about Jesus. Does that thrill anybody in the room? So would you pray about us? Every day at 945, which is 845, no, no, 1045 your time, we stop as a staff and we pray together. If we've got the ears of the whole world, we need to be saying what the world needs to hear. Would you put us on your prayer list whenever you do pray? This map that I've just shared with you is on the table in, in the lobby. Would you, would you take that, get a copy of that map and put it where you pray? And remember what's going out every day to the world, that we might say the very things that God needs to hear. i got to close, but I'll be happy to answer questions after we conclude if you've got some. But I've come to thank you. I hope you feel thanked. I hope you were encouraged for what your tool of ministry is doing in the world. Come, see, go, and tell the sweet message of Jesus to those that have never heard the message. And there will be that little girl in the Middle East today who will hear the sweet name of Jesus for the very first time. Don't know where you are in your journey with God. Tonight, do you need to come? Or do you need to come back? Do you need to come and confess your faith in Jesus as being uh, the Son of God and your Savior and be immersed into Jesus Christ? Or maybe we, you know, we need to come back. If you need to come down an aisle, that would be wonderful. But if you just need to pray where you are, that the Lord might help you be all that he wants you to be in that journey with him. That's what this song and this moment is really all about. We help in any way. Let those needs be made known. Would you stand together? Let's worship together in song. Wonderful story of love. Tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love. Wake the immortal strain. Angels with rapture announce it. Shepherds with wonder receive it. Sinner, oh, would you believe it? Wonderful story of love. Wonderful, 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 wonderful story of love. Wonderful story of love, though you are far away. Wonderful story of love, still he does call today. Calling from Calvary's mountain, down from the crystal bright fountain, in from the dawn of creation. Wonderful story of love. 
story of love Jesus provides a rest wonderful story of love for all this joy and bless rest in those mansions above us with those who've gone on before us singing the rapturous chorus wonderful story of love wonderful story of love. Well, Andy, thank you for the message. Technology is a wonderful thing. I apologize that ours didn't cooperate quite as well for you this evening, but it was an excellent message and an important one to share with us. Thank you very much. Some announcements to share with you among our sick. Mildred McCain, that's Dorothy Wilkinson's sister, is now back at Elmcroft in Reno. John Love had surgery on June 22nd at OSU. Ruth Daly and Terry Baldwin, that's Carla's sister, are now both at home after their stays in the hospital. If you had uh, chosen to participate in the Women's Care Center Baby Bottle Campaign, um, those were due back today. Um, look, Tracy, do they have a date that they're picking up? Okay, so if you did not hear that, if you forgot it tonight, you've got another day or two to drop it off to Tracy in the office. And if you did take a bottle and didn't end up filling it, please bring in the empty bottles to return to them. Uh, we need some teachers and assistants for the fall quarter. Volunteers are needed to teach and or assist for the fall quarter for children's Bible classes. Sign up sheets for that can be found out in the lobby. If you have any questions about that, you can speak to either of our deacons in charge of that ministry, and that's Michael Morgan and Tim Lowry. We also are in need of some volunteers for the Friends and Family Day that's scheduled for this uh, September on the 19th. We need help uh, setting it up, cleaning it up, ordering meat and rolls, decorating, and etc. And of course, there's always the help needed consuming all the food. If you're interested in that, there is also a sign-up sheet you can find for that out in the lobby on the bulletin board. If you were unable to partake of communion this morning, it has been prepared for uh, you, and it's in the multi-purpose room. If you have need of that as we go to sing the final song, you can exit the rear of the auditorium. Please go up the ramp to the multi-purpose room on that side. Uh, that's where I believe a lamb will be waiting to serve you. I invite you back every opportunity you have. This Wednesday, we will continue our summer series. That's been an excellent uh, series of messages. I'm sure that will continue. And then, of course, next Sunday morning, 9, nine o'clock for Bible study and 10 o'clock for worship. Following that final song, uh, Todd Haig will lead our minds in a closing prayer. I want to thank Dennis for leading our singing this evening, Michael for our opening prayer, Terry for reading our scripture, and, of course, Andy for joining us to tell us about the ministry. So with that, we'll let Dennis continue. Stand and sing number 391. I would mention if anyone has a song that they like that we rarely sing or maybe never sing, I would be happy to work it into a, uh, an evening uh, song service if you'd like to do that. I could give it a shot. The worst thing that's happened is I crash and burn. So I've crashed and burned before, so no, no big deal. Uh, number 391. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. 
She is a dear creation, like water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her, since she is holy bright. Good with his blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one o'er all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One heavenly name she blesses, partakes one holy food. And to one hope she presses with every grace in Jude. Though with a scornful wonder we see her sore oppressed, her doctrines bent asunder by names and creeds distressed. Yet saints their watch are keeping, they cry, how long, how long? And soon the tide of weeping shall be the morn of song. Let us pray together. Dear God, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had to be here tonight and to hear this message. We thank you for Andy and his ability, and we thank you for the work that is going on. Pray that you will please continue to bless it, and that people the world over can hear about you and your son, and be willing to accept the good news which they are preaching. Father, please be with each one of us in our everyday walks of life. Help us to always... Look for opportunities to share that same good news with those around us. Help us to always remember that we teach not only with our words, but with our actions. Father, we pray that you will please be with those that are sick. Please be with those on our prayer list. And go with each one of us now as we are about to depart. Please give us a safe journey home. And if it be thy will, bring us back at the next appointed time. For it's in Christ's name which we pray. Amen. <laughs>